This is Matt Hurd at Obsessive Viewer on Twitter. This is Tiny at Obsessive Tiny on Letterboxd. And this is ObsessiveViewer.com's The Obsessive Viewer Podcast. And welcome to The Obsessive Viewer. We're a movie and TV podcast that covers a specific topic, be it genre, trope, movie, or show each episode. You can find more of our work at ObsessiveViewer.com, more of our podcasts at ObsessiveViewer.com slash podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and join the Facebook group at Facebook.com slash The Obsessive Viewer. You can also support us on Patreon for at Patreon.com slash Obsessive Viewer at the minimum rate of $1 per month for an exclusive RSS feed with content recorded specifically for Patreon supporters. Um, I'm your aforementioned and one of your aforementioned hosts, Matt Hurt, and with me today, as usual, is Tiny. Hey, buddy. Hi, Tiny. How's it going? It's going good, man. Good, good, good. Um, I was going to ask you how you felt about the Patreon recording that we just did, <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah. Uh Yeah, that was a very long, tangent-ridden... Mm-hmm. Um, Cool. It's probably going to take you just as long to edit that as it is the main episode. Oh, I checked the recording time. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much of that we were just taught, like, is not going to make it into the episode because we talked a lot beforehand. And I just mm-hmm. had it rolling. Uh, that recording was an hour and 49 minutes. Holy crap. Yeah. And, uh, Phew. yeah. So, uh, check out patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Yeah. Um, we just talked about some serious shit and, uh, yeah. It was, it was, I mean, it was a good conversation, I thought. But, totally. You know, totally. yeah. Uh, we also played a game, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did. We run the game at there. <laughs> uh, but no, but today on the show, we're going to be reviewing two documentaries that just recently came out. Mm-hmm. Um, August 21st, the documentary Desert uh, One came out um, about an attempt to rescue the uh, hostages in Iran in 1980. And then we are going to review uh, the new release documentary, Unfit, the Psychology psychology of uh donald trump uh which is available on vod and uh theatrical uh limited theatrical run uh as of august 28th i think is when it got pushed up to so um yeah so both those documentaries are going to be covered in this episode so looking forward to talking to you about these documentaries tiny Mm -hmm. um but first i want to talk about a few things that have gone on in the world of entertainment and everything uh, first of all, it is August 26th, and we're still in a pandemic. Um, just to kind of clock it, uh, how are you out on the pandemic and everything? How's it going? Um, uh, it's going yeah. fine. Yeah, just still still wearing my mask and stuff. Nice. Uh, I see most people wearing their masks, so mm-hmm. that's encouraging in a way. Nice. So, yeah. Good, good. I have seen several people wearing masks, too. I uh, went to the store today. Like I went to Target for like the first time in a while. Most people were wearing masks and it was it was cool. Um yeah, it's just such a fucking it's just a weird world. Weird weird world we live in. It is the things we have to care about. Yep, yep, it is very strange. Yep. Um so on that same front, by the way, if you go to our T public store, if you go to tpublic.com and type in obsessive viewer or link in the show notes and everything to our actual store. Uh, you can now buy obsessive viewer branded masks. So you can get an obsessive viewer mask, a tower junkies mask or anthology mask. Um, so do that. Uh, go uh, check that out, buy a mask and help support us because some of that money goes to us. Um, yeah. So tiny, have you bought a mask yet? <laughs> Uh, I haven't bought one of ours yet, no. Oh, okay. Not yet. That's cool. I'm a big fan of the neck gaiter thing. That's, neck gaiter Like, thing. it's kind of like a sleeve that kind of, you can, like, roll it down around your neck and then pull it up over your face. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what I go with. Uh, it's nice. so much more comfortable. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, I have um one that's the uh from amazon i bought on amazon i bought three of them um where it ties in the back in two spots so it ties oh, yeah. on the back at the neck and on the top of the head so right. that's nice because like i can just have it tied uh behind uh, like on the back of my neck and then when i need it like when i'm getting up from my desk at work or i'm going somewhere i can just kind of leave it dangling um 
and then when I need it, just tie the top part right. and cover my face. So right, right. Yeah, but my also my employer sent <laughs> sent uh, a mask with the company name on it uh, to every employee. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. Well, most companies are doing that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So. That's the world we live in. It is. Um, so, yeah, check out our T Public store for masks. Um, mine just shipped today, so I'm excited about that. So, Tiny, the last time that we released an episode, uh, Ben and I <laughs> had recorded August 12th, I think. Mm-hmm. And on August 13th, <laughs> the next day, um, AMC announced that they were reopening and that they were reopening like August 20th. Mm-hmm. Um, have you kept up with what all happened with that? Oh, no, not at all. Okay, cool, because I can just recount it for everyone and for posterity. So mm-hmm. everyone who's listening to this will know that I have been a huge supporter of AMC. Mm-hmm. I have, I, like, I fell in love with their A-list program um, very much, just really, like, I, I was very impressed with A-list and everything. Um, man, I really think that they, uh, it's a tough call, it's a tough position but i think that they really just really shat the bed with this i maybe i don't know maybe i'm overreacting so mm-hmm. basically what happened and they are reopened amc theaters are reopened and you can go see a movie now in the theater mm-hmm. tenant is coming out in like a week as of this recording okay um and yeah it's it's like a big thing so the safety measure measures that they have in place and i've talked about this on patreon and and previous things but the actual official ones since they have officially reopened are well okay so in the lead up to reopening they said that their theaters would only be at 30 percent capacity and the seats would be arranged in a way that would allow for social distancing so like in the big imax theaters they have each row is empty, like each alternating row is empty. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, and only 30% capacity for the theaters. And then they also, this I thought was interesting. They, uh, they, in honor of their 100 year anniversary, their opening day reopening strategy marketing thing, uh, on August 20th, every ticket was cost 15 cents. Holy crap. Yeah. To commemorate their, hundred year anniversary because that's the price of a ticket in like uh uh 1910 or 1920 okay um and one of the one of the fucking brilliant um tweets that i saw about that was like you know uh uh go to a movie theater during a pandemic and pay prices for when you could have gotten the spanish flu or whatever nice uh uh, yeah so funny parallel yeah but so, so that's the plan. And they also said like, oh, they have state of the art cleaning, uh, procedures and everything. And like, they're going to be thoroughly cleaning every theater in between showings. They're going to have lagging show times to allow for more thorough cleaning and everything. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah. And they also said, okay, you know, and masks are required, uh, even when you're watching in the movie, um, unless you're enjoying a delicious, uh, concession from the concession stand. Sure. Um, and so they announced that, and then, first of all, one of, like, the first comment that I saw on, like, a news article about that on Facebook was, well, there's no way that they're going to uh, be able to make everyone wear masks during the movie, because they're not going to be going into the movie theaters and stuff, so we're fine. It's <laughs> like, okay, fuck you yeah. so much right now. Um so that was one thing. And then, and then like that gave me a lot of trepidation. Like I've been very, uh, very vocal about how like, Oh, the day that they're going to reopen, I'm going to go and just spend a full day there and everything. But no, I haven't gone to the theater. I don't know when I'm going to go to a movie theater Yeah, because as we'll talk about it in the, uh, reviews. Did I, I said, we're going to review desert one. Did I ever say what the second one was? Yeah. Okay, good. Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, you did. Um, okay. Anyway, sorry. Um, so yeah, I don't know when I'll go because as we're going to talk about in the reviews, nothing has been fucking done about this thing. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's just not, it's going to go on forever. I saw like a headline that like the University of Alabama had 500 cases of COVID. Really? In like a day or something. Mm. So, yeah, it's not going away because people don't fucking listen. And I don't know. Anyway, so 
Thirty percent capacity, cleaning things, masks mandated, and everything. And then the day that they opened, I looked on the app and everything, and like oddly enough, like when you go to the app and you go to the theater and you select a showtime and everything, it says it, like before the reopening, it would say that theaters are going to be at at uh, at thirty percent capacity. But then when they opened up, or like a day after they opened up, it's like. It's going to be 40% capacity, very quietly, oh, like doing that. It. And something that I noticed that I'm like, there's like, why the, f- why would you do this? It's the thing that I noticed that really disturbed me was that they have the smaller auditoriums open too. So, mm-hmm. like, you can go see a movie in one of the very small, compact auditoriums during a pandemic. Like, I, that just, that does not sit with me well at all. Like, if you're going to open during a pandemic, close those auditoriums and open the bigger auditoriums, which they are open and everything, Mm -hmm. but to allow for, like, actual social distancing and everything. Right. (sighs) So, yeah. So, that's annoying. Um yeah, yeah. And I had me- <laughs> I had messaged or uh, texted Kirsten when the announcement came about them reopening and I was like, uh what did I uh I said like so they're reopening in a couple of weeks and then she's like, "Yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to go go to a movie theater." I'm like, "Yeah, me neither." And then I was like, "But if we're not willing to die from movies, then what's this all been about?" <laughs> um but yeah, it's just it's it's too soon. It's it's not it's not safe. I'm not. I'm not gonna do it. Um, what's your take on it? How do you feel about it? All this. Yeah, I think it's probably gonna be a failed experiment, both uh, pandemically and business wise. Mm. Like, I don't think they're gonna be able to sustain their business very well. I mean, I understand they're going from selling no tickets to right. selling twenty percent of what they were or whatever. Mm-hmm. So anything's anything is an improvement, but I just don't yeah. think it's gonna be very sustainable during this. Do you say that um, because you don't know that people will go or that they'll be able to sustain it with the thirty percent capacity? Yeah, because like even even if they sell out. Okay. Right, it's not gonna be and there's gonna be people who are less likely to eat and drink, which is where they make the bulk of their money on concessions, right. you know? I think that's gonna hurt them. Um so business wise I just don't see it panning out well. Mm-hmm. But like from a pandemic standpoint Part of me wants to say, well, you know, we've all been there have not we all, but mm-hmm. most people have been going to grocery stores and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure there's some spreading going on there, but we can't trace everything to that. And, and you know, I, I think I think people are going to be going out anyway. So what's the point or what's the problem with this? And I think the problem is a movie theater is a unique environment because mm-hmm. you're not just you know, walking up and down aisles for 30 to 45 minutes in a grocery store, you're sitting in a seat Mm -hmm. with other people, a closed room for two hours. Yeah. It's a little different. And so it's just like, everything's just circulating in there. And I, again, I don't know all the science and I don't, I don't know exactly how this thing's spreading and no one does, I don't think, but we should still be taking measures. And I think, Mm -hmm. I think there's probably going to be some cases of contact tracing that lead back to movie theaters. Yeah. And it's going to become oh, yeah. a a bit of a hot spot area for mm-hmm. transmission. Yep. I agree. And that's what I huh, am avoiding them for, which is such a bummer. But I'm probably still going to go see Tenet, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. So <laughs> you can see it at the drive-in. Yeah, fuck that. Yeah. I just, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I... I don't know. I feel... I say all that, and I completely agree with the science, but I just... I've been out in mm-hmm. the world 40 hours a week since this thing began. Nothing's changed for me in that regard, mm-hmm. and I just... I don't... Obviously, I'm not saying I'm immune to it right. or anything like that, but I just feel like... I don't know. It's not. It's not stigmatized for me. I can understand the yeah. logic of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I just. I, I'm not really afraid of it personally. Mm. And that's stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> and I, it's probably not the best. I know it's not the best attitude to have. Right. Um, but I don't know. I've, we've been going to restaurants. We've been going to stores. Um, 
I go into office buildings and schools and factories every day, and I just, I don't know. It's Nothing's changed for me. Mm-hmm. And I think as long as we take the steps, it's okay. But again, yeah. I think I think a movie theater is a different situation. Yeah, I I agree completely with that. Like yeah. I've had conversations where it's like, okay, well, what would it take to get you into the movie theater? I'm like, how can I get you in this movie theater today? Right. Um, but like it is it is my my main thing, and I've said this before, is that if I were to get this virus, I don't know how I will respond to it. Right. I don't know how or if I will transmit it to others because like my like I live alone so it's it's pretty easy for me to quarantine myself and everything. Mm-hmm. But if I were to be like asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic before even being aware that I had contracted it and I happen to interact with my mom or my sister mm-hmm. or my mom has health problems, my sister has a newborn baby, um I can't deal with that and the the, an extension of that or uh, in addition to that i don't know how if i were to become symptomatic or i were to were to contract the virus i would not be able to go into work where i work two days a week in the office building that i work in and i'm sure that the company would be able to accommodate me because i work most of the time at home but i don't know how that would factor out i don't know how that would play out right and i don't want that stress Mm -hmm. and the question of okay if you go to a movie theater if i i should i'll amend that and say if i go to a movie theater knowing my brain that means okay i'm going to go to a movie theater i'm going to sit in a seat for two two and a half hours three hours maybe um depending on the length and i will leave that building that <laughs> so during that time i will be constantly thinking about like any noise that the audience makes Mm -hmm. i will be conscious of any cough any clearing of the throat i will be distracted by that then i will have been able to see a movie in my favorite place to see a movie in a movie theater but then for the next two weeks i will be second guessing any sniffle any sore throat any ailments i may have or be uh uh um or maybe psychosomatic, I will be just a freaking anxious mess that right. entire time. Right. And that is the best case scenario. Right. Right. Like if, and if like that's, that's stress and anxiety that I don't need in my life. You're guaranteed to have a bad movie experience. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to ruin like one of your favorite things to do. E- exactly. So I completely, yep. yeah, I understand yep. why you wouldn't go. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, it's, and again, that's the best case scenario. Mm-hmm. Like the worst case scenario is I die. Right. Um, and right. I can't, I can't justify that. I can't justify that risk or that mental, like gymnastics or mental roller coaster, mental mm-hmm. and emotional roller coaster for a movie that I can see in six months at home. Right. Um, it's just it's just so fucking weird. Yeah, I totally so, yeah. get that. Yep. Um so that is my kind of thought on <laughs> I will say it, I don't think anyone should go see a movie in the movie theater. Yeah. Like everyone's free to do whatever they want, but in my not professional opinion, but my opinion, I don't think it's the right time. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. So you're going to see Tenant. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'll see how it's going. Yeah. If there, if there's a bunch, if I see shit in the news where it's like, you know, 160 cases traced to this one movie theater, like, okay, never yeah. mind, right? Um, which again, I think that's a real possibility. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd almost say it's likely. Yeah. I, I was going to say um, it's maybe a pro, like maybe it's probable. Right. Um, it's just um, a matter of time. Yeah. Um, and it's, yeah. uh, it's a bummer. Mm. Um, so you wouldn't want to see it in the drive-in though. No. Yeah. I'm the same. Like I talked to Ben about it and he, like he had, he had suggested, like, Oh, Hey, we should go see tenant like in different cars, obviously. Yeah. But I was like, I, cause my thing is like the, the drive-in format, the drive-in experience is 
way too distracting to me. Mm-hmm. And the sound is not sound is such an important component of movies. Right. And given the blistering headaches that I had after I saw Interstellar in the theater, um, <laughs> I've got to imagine that it's going to be just as loud and bombastic as that was. Right. Um, so I don't know. I feel like drive-ins are great, especially if it's for like a revival thing or like, like a, uh, re re-release kind of thing. It's all about the context. Yeah. 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 And I don't think tenant fits in that context very well. No, it's, it's not, I don't think it's a very good, uh, I don't think it's very good for the visual medium either. Like I right. feel like the screens just aren't up to snuff. And, nope. The projector yeah, is, the, yeah, it's yeah. just not there. Um, I, not to say that there, I'm sure there are some drive-ins that have state of the art stuff that's right. been updated and it's nice, but we only have a couple here in Indy. Yeah. And they're very outdated. Yeah. Um, which has its own s- nostalgic charm to it, but it's yeah. just not. I want to say Tibbs has upgraded have they? to some, yeah something maybe not like high state of the art but yeah they've upgraded to something yeah okay um also on the same subject uh keystone art is reopening like in two days okay um yeah so i don't know that i'm not gonna go but yeah they're reopening and i mean hopefully hopefully they survive and hopefully their patrons survived but i just i can't i can't fathom it i know um yeah. And what's interesting is that uh Fekus hasn't gone that I've seen. Um oh, I need yeah. to touch base with Fekus cuz like he's had covid so Right. Um he doesn't necessarily think he'll get it again. Right. Um so he is um like I think he said that he would go see a movie but I don't know. Hmm. So yeah. Yep, so that happened. <laughs> um Yeah. Yeah, we will keep you guys posted with how much uh COVID changes everything in the coming months also. Right. <sighs> yeah. Did you, In March, did you have any idea that it would be like this now? No, I really didn't. Ugh. Yeah, I I was, yeah, I don't know. I guess we should have known better. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That yeah. this wasn't just going to go away in a couple months or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's just so weird. It is. Um, Yeah. And I, oh, I didn't tell you about my dream, did I? This is great podcasting. <laughs> um, I had a nightmare about masks and everything. Really? Yeah, it's uh, it's weird. So I had a dream, and I promise we'll actually do podcasting stuff now. <laughs> um, I had a dream where I was going to our friend Kyle's house, his parents' house from okay. high school. Wow. Um, and I knocked on the door. And his parents opened the door and they were wearing face masks. And I like, this was, this was horrifying to me. They took the face masks off and their mouths, like it was like their, it was like their, their lips had fused together in like this ink like substance was like creating the opening of their mouths. And it was like dripping and just looked painful that's some freaky shit. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So yeah, I'm very uh curious what um <laughs> what uh psychological effects this year. And that's another thing. This year, everyone's saying like, "Oh, 2020 is terrible and everything." January 1st is not going to change anything. Not so much. And that is going to be such a downer. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. So anyway, um, other things that have happened <laughs> before we get into our reviews, mm-hmm. um, the stand, the new mini series. Yes. It was announced that it's going to launch on December 17th. Are you excited? Obviously. Totally. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm excited because it means that I can finally plan on when we are going to, going to early, re- start releasing our stand series of episodes on Tower <laughs> Junkies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so spoiler alert. Uh, make sure if you are a- excited to listen to our reviews of the stand and its different iterations and everything, um, you should definitely be subscribed to Tower Junkies on October 28th. Um, <laughs> because that is when the first one will drop. Sweet. And if everything goes as planned, which I think it might actually for once, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be able to release content on that podcast every week, every Wednesday. Until 
December 17th, Thursday, December 17th, when we launch our reviews of the new stand. That is contingent on whether or not we get screeners, which I am right. working really hard to get us access to that. So yeah. I say working really hard. I sent one email <laughs> month, months ago. Um, well, that's the 2020 version of working really hard. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that's exciting. I'm excited. And I'm excited for you guys to listen to those episodes. It's funny to be excited about something that's still four months out. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, yeah. Not that I have a problem with that. Right. Though, but it's just like, uh, get here. One of the, one of the, like, tweets that I saw about the stand was, uh, it's, it's fitting that the stand is going to come out, at, uh, at the end of 2020. Like, it's going to close <laughs> out 2020 with the stand. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah. Yeah, the timing is just nuts. Yep. So. Yeah, for, for that property. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it'll be, it'll be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. I th- I think I'm there's other things but I want to get to our reviews at some yes. point. Um so Tiny we're going to review two documentaries. Um like I said these documentaries came out uh recently. So the first one we're going to do is Desert 1 which is available on VOD uh and all the usual places. Desert 1 is directed by Barbara Koppel. And of course we're going to do a how should we do this? Non-spoiler and spoiler review because it's kind of tough with yeah, documentaries. It it's kind of hard. Um, for Desert One, we'll do a non-spoiler and spoiler review because people might not be aware of the of the subject matter. Mm-hmm. But I think for Unfit, we probably not worry about spoilers. <laughs> Um, anyway, so Desert One, we're going to go into our non-spoiler review of Desert One. Uh, Desert One directed by Bar- uh, Barbara Koppel. Uh, the plot summary is the true story behind one of the most daring rescues in modern U.S. history, a secret mission to free hostages captured during the 1979 Iranian Revolution. Um, so Tiny, this documentary um, came out August 21st. Again, it's available digitally everywhere. Um how do you feel about this uh about this documentary in kind of broad terms and actually before that did you have what knowledge did you have of the subject matter before going into it um overall i really really love this documentary nice. um uh especially just looking at it objectively like as a piece of art i think they strung all this together really well because like the mission itself that they're talking about there's a ton of moving parts mm-hmm. so you literally have these giant names with President Jimmy Carter and Vice President Mondale, mm-hmm. and you have these, you know, generals and majors yeah. and sergeants and all these incredibly talented people who were um, all involved in this mission, and they all have their side of the story yeah. and their different aspects to tie in together. So weaving it all together is really challenging. Plus... um there's actual archival footage, mm-hmm. there's recordings, transcripts, um, and then in addition to that, they went all out and they made this really compelling um, an- animated uh, animation to, yes. to tell these stories that, you know... I think I think if you're pitching a, pitching a documentary and you're like, well, we kind of want to fill in some of these stories with animation. Like if I'm mm-hmm. listening to that, I'm like, really? Like that's yeah. that's an iffy thing. But they really nailed it. It's, it was very comic book graphic novel, mm-hmm. but not like it wasn't hokey. They weren't like playing it up. And, By no means was it gratuitous or anything. It was right. very artistic. It was very yeah. artistic and very. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like um, uh, like like detail oriented mm-hmm. realistic it wasn't it wasn't showy just really well yeah. done animation I, I appreciated that they took the time to do that right because obviously listening to these people tell the story has it's it's is a compelling in and, of, in and of itself but adding that visual aspect really just gave it a whole nother level of credibility um that i really appreciated and i think made it a a top notch really compelling documentary so yeah i love that overall um, and 
to the other part of your question, mm-hmm. I really knew nothing. About, I didn't even know this mission existed. Oh, me neither. Which I feel, yeah. I, I feel bad about. I had no idea. You know, I think 2012, we all watched the movie Argo and it won Oscars mm-hmm. and we thought it was really cool. And I was like, oh, that's the story of rescuing the hostages, you know, yeah. and that's what we all kind of, that's what at least people who weren't there for it, like us, you know, um, mm-hmm. that was my context for this story. And I had no idea that it goes so much deeper and there's so many things attached to this event, um, like the election of 1980 and mm-hmm. uh, our tension with Iran to this day, um, stuff like that. Uh, it's it's incredible, this story, and how unknown it is to people like in our generation. And yeah. I think some of the people who even, you know, like the... Um, like the Gen Xers who were alive during this, but maybe they were kids and mm-hmm. yeah, so many people I think just have forgotten that the that this mission happened. Yeah. And it's oh, yeah. really a tragedy. Yeah, it's and that was something that I was really <laughs> so um it's been a while since I've seen Argo. Yeah, me too. Did not connect it to this story when I watched this. Really? <laughs> yeah, like I Argo, I need to watch Argo again but mm-hmm. I didn't know that it had to do with the same kind of thing. Yeah, it was the same event. The, really? The revolution it was oh. getting hostages out of there but huh. I, I don't, I don't know, it's weird. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know about that. I <laughs> wasn't really that aware of the hostage thing. Like I didn't know that that was a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I rem- Like the one thing that I remember was um there was a reference and this is going to be just embarrassing on my part there was a reference in i think an episode of friends i don't remember the context i don't remember what it was i think it was friends but there was a there was a line about a uh um a videotape that um was recorded over or something and I think Chandler or someone says like, well now, now it's this and the hostages coming home. <laughs> and like, <laughs> that was the con, that was the only thing that I really knew about this. Uh, not That's the only awareness I had of this hostage situation. Okay. Like I didn't know the, I didn't know what it was about. I didn't know what happened exactly. I don't know how necessarily it was resolved. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything about the political climate, the, um, the, uh, um, Oh, uh, diplomatic relations or anything. And the thing that really stood out to me and really just shocked me was the length of it. I mean, this was a, this went on for so long Mm -hmm. and like, I can't imagine it. Um, and something I really respect about the documentary, it, it reminds me a lot of, um, the documentary we saw at Heartland, um, USS Indianapolis, the legacy. Yeah. Um, very kind of a verite style thing where it's just people talking and telling the story to the camera, mm-hmm. interspersing uh, different stories or different uh, perspectives from different talking heads and everything. Um, very uh, well done in that respect. Like the the way that the narrative flowed through these talking heads, uh, coupled with the animation, which was I think was just striking and just beautiful yeah. um really made this in a, a very uh deep and engaging documentary um i do like how it um how it does talk about the 1980 election um my my one criticism of the documentary is that i don't think it really <sighs> It's a weird balancing act, but I kind of wish that it would have delved more into that election, the campaigns and everything and Mm -hmm. all that. That's probably fodder for an entirely different documentary. Right. Um, But I did like the way that the campaigns kind of factored into it. Um, And then again, I also kind of think maybe that's just me living in 2020, (laughs) like just the election is looming and like that's just what my interest is at right now. Right. but for the actual depiction and the telling of the story of the the rescue operation, I was really enthralled by it. I uh, I, j- I thought it was really captivating. There were moments where the uh, the people speaking um, kind of broke down in tears mm-hmm. several times, and just it was heartbreaking. And I, it just resonated with me in, in a big way. So I was really I was really pretty impressed with this documentary. Me too. Um, there's definitely some high emotional parts. Um, 
one thing as well that's of yeah. note is that they they spoke to actual Iranians, uh, Persian, yeah. Persians who were involved in this event. Um, you know, they, in the eyes of the United States government, they're criminals. Right. You know, that, I mean, blatantly they were criminals. They were right. holding people hostage. But mm-hmm. um, just the way they spoke so plainly about it and it's just, it's just wild how the context changes everything. Like, mm-hmm. you know, from their perspective, they were attacked by the United States. The United States yeah. um, took advantage of Iran for decades and did not promote democracy and did not promote proper government and mm-hmm. turned a blind eye to terrible atrocities from the Shah and supported him the whole time. Yeah. So they're understandably upset, right? And right. It does not justify what they did. Um, but, you know, to them, the eight people who, t- to them, the, the tragedy that occurred with this mission isn't really a tragedy. Yeah. And from our perspective, it's, it's a horrific tragedy. Right. And it's, that's just one thing that it's like, you know, you try to be, as the viewer, you try to be, uh, empathetic mm-hmm. when you can be, but it's just like, I was, I was felt my, myself getting upset and like yeah. uh, mad about how, like, there was one lady who was like a translator during some of the, I don't know what she was. Actually, I can't remember what exactly what she did, yeah. but she, uh, she was involved and she was talking about how much pleasure she took in some of this stuff. Yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, well, right. I, mean, I, I don't want to hear this. And like this, I'm, I'm really getting pissed off about this. And, I don't know. It, it, it's interesting that they left that stuff in there, or not that they left it in, but they. It's it's incredible that they went to the lengths to capture that side yeah. of the story. I guess, mm-hmm. um, and I'm glad it's there. You know, I think it provides an incredible context to the viewer. But uh, it's just it's just amazing to see. Yeah, it it definitely shows multiple facets of of the story and different perspectives that you wouldn't expect. It's just, it's right. really pretty, pretty all encompassing. Like, even though I said that I wish I would have seen more of the campaign and everything, uh, or the election cycle, I don't know how the movie could have implemented more of that without, uh, compromising the, um, pacing of the movie as a, as a whole, like it moves very yeah. briskly. And it is something that those the captivating aspect of it is in the what happens on the mission and everything and like the what is going on with the hostages themselves it's just it's there's so much more compelling storytelling in those aspects of it and that's frankly it's the more important of the story uh, to focus yeah. on that so yeah i don't i don't know but i i do like that it does show multiple facets of, of the story from different angles and perspectives. I thought that was a really good uh, strategy for the, for the documentary. Yeah. I'm also really interested in the 1980 election myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like if they would have delved more into that, it really would have taken away from the focus on the desert one mission. Yeah. That's, that's the heart of the documentary and that's mm-hmm. what it's about and about honoring those people. And I feel like if you, yeah. even if they would have taken 10 minutes or whatever to talk about, to delve more into the um, election, it would have it would have detracted from the main theme. I think. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think that deserves um, its own that deserves its own documentary. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I was surprised that they. Well, I'm not necessarily surprised that they got Jimmy Carter um, for it, yeah. but I mean, I would like. <laughs> and Walter Mondale. And Walter Mondale, but Jimmy Carter, he's 95 years old, and it's a freaking tank of a man. It's insane. Like, I mean. Yeah. Just the clarity with which he speaks and everything, and mm-hmm. just uh, really, yeah, I was impressed. He still like goes and builds houses and stuff. Jesus, I know it's incredible. That's insane. He's an incredible guy. It's unfortunate yeah. he only had one term. Yeah, and as far as the like, I wonder something. I don't want to give away anything in the documentary, but I just wonder if if he had handled it better um mm-hmm. would that have shorn up a shorn uh shirt up um a second term for him like right it's just that that's an angle of it that i would be very interested to see yeah um yeah. who knows but i you know i think this was i think he already had a few nails in his coffin yeah and that was the last one 
Um, not that I know, again, not that I know a lot about his presidency, but that's mm. what I've heard. Um, but I, I think he, being Jimmy Carter and his administration, deserve a lot of criticism for the way they handled this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, I think what we get away from in American politics throughout our history and especially now mm-hmm. is the idea that most politicians, I don't want to say all, but most politicians truly have the best interest of the United States at heart when they make decisions. Mm-hmm. We just differ on how we get there, right? That's, yeah. that's supposed to be the heart of American politics. Now, sometimes it's, it's bastardized and we get incredibly polarized on certain issues, but there are, that's, that's supposed to be the crux of what it is to be an American politician. Mm-hmm. And I think Jimmy Carter easily falls into that category. Mm-hmm. I think he really wanted to do the best for the country and he wanted to save those hostages, but he also has his principles. Yeah. And he stuck to his principles and I think he paid the price for it. And, you know, the hostages. Mm-hmm. had to sacrifice a lot of time to, uh, to to for him to hold up his principles but you know maybe he could have done things differently and it would i don't know it's i i, I have i have, what i'm trying to say is i have respect for him mm-hmm. and and i think you can look back on it with 2020 vision and uh, literally yeah <laughs> nice. and be critical but I think he was trying to do his best at the time and make mm-hmm. the best decisions he could yeah. keep us out of a war. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I think he deserves credit for that. Absolutely. And there's a part in the documentary that like it shows that he, I mean, he seems like a, like a decent person and right. a smart guy. Like he, in the documentary, I think I think the chairman of the Joint Chiefs um, said that when he gave the okay or gave the go ahead for the the mission, um, he said that Jimmy Carter said that if if we're successful, everyone's gonna congratulate you guys or everyone's gonna credit you guys. Mm-hmm. If we fail, they're gonna credit me with that. Right. <laughs> like he knew that that's what was at stake, and like mm-hmm. he still did it and everything. And what's um, interesting is typically there's a lot of military guys in this documentary. Oh yeah. And typically those guys are just let's go. Let's yeah. run in there, guns blazing, get these people out. Mm. And that was kind of the the main the crux of the argument with this with this crisis was mm-hmm. most people there were people who who said let's let's drop in some troops, boots on the ground, get these people out of there. On the other hand, you had the Carter administration saying let's let diplomacy try to work things out first. Let's mm-hmm. be diplomatic about this. We don't want to start a war. Right. Let's be careful. Those are the two sides of the argument. And typically your military guys are the gung ho ones who want mm-hmm. to just get stuff done. And what's interesting is not one of those mil they're also they also speak their mind. Right. That's the other thing. Military guys are kind of known for that. Mm. Um not one of them was like, yeah, Jimmy Carter would completely shit the bed on this. He right. made terrible decisions. Uh, he's an awful president. Like, none of them said that at all. Mm-hmm. And God knows they've earned the right to do that. Yeah. But it's, I, I was kind of surprised, frankly, especially mm-hmm. like, um, Beckwith, I think, was the, the commanding officer. And he, mm-hmm. I, I assume he's maybe passed away because he wasn't. Yeah, because there wasn't any. He wasn't in the documentary. Just had voiceover. Recordings of him. Yeah. Um, but like the guy who was like the flight commander for the mission, um, mm-hmm. Ed, okay. uh, I can't remember uh, his name. Uh, something with an S. Yeah. Yeah. He, he seemed like a very, I don't know, like a very gung ho military guy. Yeah. And, you know, I would have thought eventually that he was going to say some stuff about Jimmy Carter, but Mm -hmm. none of them did. And to me that gives credence and legitimacy to the actions that Jimmy Carter took, Mm -hmm. regardless of my feelings on him and my limited knowledge of it. Um, So that, that's one thing that kind of surprised me. Maybe it just, maybe those guys have opinions and they were just being professional about it. And they were just Mm -hmm. like, you know, it's about, it's about the mission. It's not about the politics behind it. You know, they could have taken that attitude, but, um, that's just one aspect of the documentary that surprised me. Yeah. Uh, I agree with that. And yes, Charles Beckwith has passed away. Okay. Um, I assume so. He seemed yeah. a little bit older during the mission, like maybe mm-hmm. in the sixties or so, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, yeah. And let's, let's talk a little bit about the animation also. Like mm-hmm. 
I I think that the technique is like it's I think it's called cell shading where it takes if my Wikipedia is right um, <laughs> it take it's like it's designed to um create like a 3D uh, like a 3D kind of image into a 2D space um through i don't know more vibrant colors I don't, I don't know i don't know what the process is but it's very colorful it's very um like tiny said it, it's like a like a kind of graphic novel type look um and there are moments in it where like this is this animation is used to recount like action moments like right. moments where things happen that are that are big events in the story um and i think that it it skirts that line or it, it dances on that line of being thrilling, but also being respectful of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really showcases like the, the space that they were in. Um, when certain things happen, there's like a, uh, there's a confined space aspect to some uh, parts of the story that just really resonated through that animation. That's what I'll say about that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It was it was uh, really um, pretty pretty engaging. It was definitely. Yeah. Have you seen any of Barbara Koppel's other? I, her name runners? did not. I don't know. Her name did not sound familiar to me. Okay, I haven't seen any of her stuff, but she um, is known for. Uh, I know it's Harlan County, USA. I think from the seventies. Okay. Um. Let's see. Harlan County, USA, uh, American Dream, Shut Up and Sing. Yeah, I had never seen any of her stuff. Yeah, I don't think I have either. Hmm. Um, does this make you want to check out more of her stuff? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I really did enjoy her style. Nice. She did a good job. Um, Me too. Oh, she's got a 30 for 30 from 2010. Yeah. <laughs> um, Interesting. Yeah, I, I will definitely check out some of her other stuff. Um, nice. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um I will as well. Uh she also directed a lot of episodes of Oz. Okay, that's oh, pretty that's a damn good show. Another aspect of it that I, I really liked was um the kind of archival footage and specifically the news footage. Mm-hmm. Um I was unclear there's there's pretty uh, there's a pretty graphic moment where they show um graphic images um of people and just i i mean it was i mean it was kind of hard to hard to watch it was yeah was that was that on iranian tv iranian, iranian okay TV, yeah. okay that had to be yeah okay yeah, yeah um i was i was a little unclear on that i was like okay um mm-hmm. that's not yeah um yeah and seeing that moment um i don't know if we can go into spoilers there but yeah um well it's it was the equivalent of, I guess, if on 9-11 there were mm. remains left over from the 19 hijackers and we took their bodies and displayed them on the news yeah, and mocked them. I guess that's to put yourself in the shoes of an, a patriotic Iranian person or Persian mm-hmm. person at the time. That might be how they felt. Right. During that time. And I, I think I put myself in that situation and I think, you know, I'm maybe not going to do the United States government any favors by returning these remains to them, but mm-hmm. I'm not going to desecrate the dead at the same time, right. regardless of what they did. Absolutely. I, I, that's still, you know, I mean, I'm not even like a religious person, as you all know, mm-hmm. but I just feel like that's just, a, a, again, that's, you can tell a lot about a person by how they yeah. And treat, their character. Yeah, by how you would treat someone in that situation. Yep. And that's something I could just never see myself doing. And yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's despicable behavior. I'll put it that way. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and go into spoilers. Um, okay. First, before we do that, though, uh, rating. Do you have a rating, like five stars out of five stars? I'd, I'd give it... I, I have no reason to not give it five stars. Oh, really? I nice. mean, I can't think of anything they should have done differently or changed. Nice. I mean, I think they really hit it out of the park. Yeah, it's probably. I mean, it's it's going to be a um, probably going to be a top ten for the year. Nice, if, awesome. If, if we do that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think if if it was a normal year, I think if it was a normal year and we had, unless it was like another twenty nineteen, I think mm-hmm. this would solidly be in my top ten. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I 
I mean, I think at this point it, it'll probably be a, an honorable mention for me um, if it makes my list at all. But I, I gave it three and a half stars. Um, yeah, I mean, I really liked it. I, didn't, I can't really think of anything to really ding it on. Not that, I, not that I'm seeking out things to ding it on or anything. Right. But um, other than not really – other than being more interested in the – or interested in the campaign aspect of it a little bit more than what I got – um, this is a really good documentary and yeah. really, uh, really, um, uh, just r- resonant. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. So let's go into spoilers for Desert One. I'm going to play a clip from the trailer here. So if you haven't seen it, go ahead and check the show notes for timestamps to skip ahead to our review of Unfit. Um, but if you have seen it or you don't care about spoilers, just keep listening. So we're going to go into spoilers for Desert One after this clip from the trailer. I was 20 years old, uh, a young Marine, and I was assigned to the United States Embassy in Tehran, Iran. I had never heard of that country. I hear thousands of people coming down to the embassy. And they started climbing over the gates. For two weeks, I had to sleep with my hands in plastic handcuffs. And I was scared to death. The administration is now emphasizing diplomacy as the way to get the Americans released. Iran must be the only country in the world with a television program on how to tackle American commandos in the street. Okay, so spoilers on for Desert One. Tiny, I did not know that the attempt was a failure. (laughs) I did not know that it failed. Yeah, I didn't know that either. Yeah. Um, That aspect of it was really just heartbreaking really and Mm -hmm. where a lot of the emotion of the of the people from the mission that were interviewed came through um in a big way for me yeah so yeah that was was a big part of it just the the shock of them not you know succeeding right because when when the incident happens and everything i thought that this was going to be like a thing where okay they rally together and flight of the phoenix it or something (laughs) right um but that's not the case and it was really it was interesting cuz i saw some like comments online saying that or at least i saw i saw one like letterboxd review that said that it was very much a like borderline like military propaganda movie <laughs> oh. which i don't see at all like this is depicting a fail a failed mission but it's not depicting it in a way that glamorizes the military life i don't think Mm-mm. um instead it's it's a respectful depiction of a failed mission and people that died on that mission are honored in it and i just i think that that it it's a more um empathetic documentary in that in that regard right and it, i think that's exemplified through the 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 telling of the tale from the members of, of the military who were there because yeah. pretty much every single one of them says that they were embarrassed. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, if if you look at a movie like Black Hawk Down, mm-hmm. which was a military failure. Right. right. That was that was a big blunder back in the nineties. That movie is very much pro military gung ho right. USA USA. Mm-hmm. And that movie's great. I love right. that movie. Um but again Context is key, and from other people's context, that was not a good conflict. And, right. Um, I know there's, I think Ewan McGregor's character uh, mm. he was like, um, I think he was like convicted of pedophilia like later on. And really, they like, like I think the government because the government participated in that movie, like, mm-hmm. like they gave him Black Hawk helicopters to use in the movie and shit like that. But they were like, look, you can't glorify his character anymore. Oh, wow. Like they had to scale his character back because they were like, he's in, I think he had maybe gotten killed in prison or something. Jeez. It's it's on IMDb. I remember reading that. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, that's rough. Wow. Um, but this documentary was not that. It was not glorifying the situation. It was shedding a light on it because I think maybe they're, I, I'm not a military strategist. I'm not, you know, I can't, I can't criticize their planning in any, in any effective way, Mm -hmm. but I think maybe there was a, I don't think it was a failure of planning. I think it was an inability to plan because in that, that, you know, the desert environment is really what caused the mission to fail. 
Yeah. They weren't prepared for that environment and there's mm-hmm. no way to train for that environment. Yeah. Um, the dust and the, there, there's so many X factors in the, in the, in the, the calculation of, of the success of that mission, you know, that the road, <laughs> It's interesting. They're talking about the road. It's mm-hmm. supposed to be abandoned. Like one car right. a day comes through there. Yeah. And in the first five minutes, there's a busload of people, right. and then two other trucks. Yeah. And it's just like, how the hell did this happen? Yep. That's just bad luck. Yeah. Oh, That's absolutely. Luck. You know the 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 one uh, the guy with the Japanese name his, his name was his name was Wade. Mm. Um, he was literally trying to shoot at the the truck that was coming at them and. The guy didn't stop because he had a stereo turned up too loud. He probably mm. didn't even realize he was being shot at. Yeah. And they had to shoot a damn missile at it and blow up a damn, and it was a freaking fuel truck. Yeah. That's just bad luck. Right. That shit just happens. And everything just went bad from there. And I don't think it was really anybody's fault. Right. I think it's just, it was, it was bad luck and maybe just a bit of an inability to plan properly. Yeah, I agree. And it's it was it's a, it's a, it is a tragedy that that happened. I, absolutely, Those people died for that. You know. Yeah, and the something that I, I really kind of respect about it is that in terms of presenting it not not as entertainment, but the build up toward it and toward the kind of just misfire and mis mishap and mishap and mishap. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like we, the. The documentary does a good job of demonstrating the the act like the planning of it. Like like you said, it's hard to plan for that. It's impossible for them to really get like logistics down mm-hmm. um, entirely because there's so many uh, variables in that equation. Mm-hmm. But they did th- like they talked about how, and I, I thought this was really clever. Uh, they were using like news footage <laughs> yeah. from like Dateline and from uh, from the from the evening news and everything to coordinate like their their entry points and everything and and to get the layout of the facility or of the embassy where the where the hostages were being held mm-hmm. so that they could plan their attack accordingly and plan the plan the uh the rescue mission accordingly and everything and just like those little pieces of information like that were just like the like extra dressing to the to the documentary that I I think really elevated it yeah. um and made it made it an engaging documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if they had, if they had gotten further in the mission, obviously this is speculation. Mm-hmm. If they had gotten further in the mission, you know, they were supposed to fly the helicopters into a soccer stadium right next to them. Yeah. And then they were supposed to like drop some guys off in the mountain who were going to take trucks in. Mm. And I was like, again, one of the, I think the guy, his name was Wade and he had a, mm. a Japanese last name. He was an Asian guy. Mm. Um, he said that he didn't have a lot of faith in the mission because there were too many moving parts. Yeah. And I was like, I think this would have been a Black Hawk Down situation. Yeah, I think I, a I lot can see more that. people would have died. Yeah. Hostages probably would have gotten killed because tempers mm-hmm. would have flared up. We would yeah. have lost a couple more hel- helicopters, a couple more planes. Mm-hmm. We could have added to the hostages. Right. I think it would have been really bad. Yeah. But at the same time, they could have been completely successful. Who knows? It's, Absolutely. It's, it's just a, it's a coin toss. Yeah. Um, another piece of like planning that i thought was just like insane like i just crazy to me uh was the night vision goggles like yeah in in the uh in the helicopters and everything they had to use night vision goggles Mm -hmm. just like that i thought was interesting like actual night night vision goggles definitely um something else about it in regards to jimmy carter in, in general something that in this is maybe dipping into our unfit review but something that just like struck me was that this this documentary uses um previously unheard recordings and everything and like uh formerly i guess formally classified data and everything mm-hmm. so the uh recordings are from like communications with with uh Jimmy Carter and the general in charge of the operation and everything mm-hmm. and something that i thought was was pretty subtle and in in a feather in the cap of Jimmy Carter is that he's very presidential in the role, and maybe it's because we just have a lack of that mm-hmm. now, but right. it's just like when he hears news of like, you know, we have injured people, we're not clear about the casualties, we're not sure the extent, we don't know how many or anything, but we have lost people. Um, just Jimmy Carter has that presidential, like, okay, like he just kind of, mm-hmm. he, it's internalizing it, you can tell that he is... He's poised. He's poised, yes, yes. Yeah. And it's it, that's something that I, I it resonated with me with me a bit just as someone right. who um 
uh, remembers the dignity of the office. Right. So he takes responsibility for the yeah. failure as well, which yep. he should. Right. Right. And which our current president does not do. Correct. Famously. Correct. Yep. So. Um, so yeah, that was something that really struck me and the results of the 1980 election, like, holy crap, that's yeah. just the, like he won six states and Reagan run, won the rest. Yeah. Um, that I just thought was, um, an interesting way to, to leave the documentary. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the speculation from the one, I can't remember who it was who said it, if it was a hostage or a member of the military who said mm. that. There's some speculation that people from the Reagan campaign were in talks with the Ayatollah Khomeini and oh, the yeah. leaders in Iran to basically hold the hostages until mm-hmm. he was in office. Yeah. Which is just a huge middle finger to Jimmy Carter. Yeah. That's the one thing I knew about this is that okay. they literally they literally just gave a fuck you to Jimmy Carter and just mm-hmm. held on to the hostages until God, until nuts. Reagan got into office. I actually that's the one thing I did know. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, wow. that's complete speculation. I, yeah. I question it myself. I have no, it could be true, but mm-hmm. I, I'd have a bit of a hard time believing that they did that. So it's saying that the Reagan administration was in talks with like the leaders in Iran, yeah. the Ayatollah and whatnot. So that they, and like the, the, is the documentary saying that the Reagan administration told them to wait until Reagan was in office or yeah, to make Jimmy Carter okay. look worse and to make him look better. Okay. Cause yeah. for some reason I, I read it as the Ayatollah was like, Oh, I'll, I'll release him. But only after Jimmy Carter's out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that could be the case. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it was, it was just one person who, who had that speculation. Okay. And so yeah. he's like, I can't prove it, but mm. I have a suspicion. Okay. So in the, um, just in also the fact that, you know, Jimmy Carter was doing like the morning of the inauguration. <laughs> right. Like he was le- using the last moments of him, I- of his office. Right. Um, to, to work through that and everything. It's just, I don't know. Right. Yeah. And then the yeah. shots from like in Iran where the incident is like, it's like a, a tourist attraction now for, for that was Iran. disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. That was disturbing. Yep. Yeah, because it's not like we were. I I think I wonder if that because again I keep coming back to context being key here. But mm-hmm. I wonder if you know over there if that event is presented as they were coming to attack us. Yeah. You know when that's not the case, we were doing something noble. Mm-hmm. I don't care what your perspective is. It's noble to try to rescue your people right. who are being held hostage against their will. Like, yeah. That's that's a bad thing. You know. Mm-hmm. Um. And and for them to treat it that way was disheartening. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying they got to be happy about it. Right. But to have like a festival and a celebration like that, yeah. very, it had very propaganda, dear leader, North Korea, yeah. Nazi tones to it. Um, mm-hmm. I think there was a banner that said something like, cause one of the things that like, basically nature kind of kicked their ass and that's why, mm-hmm. the, that's why the mission failed. Yeah. Uh, it said something about like, God willed nature to defeat them or something oh, yeah, like that. And I was like, like what that. the fuck? Really? Yeah. Man, I don't know. It was, that was hard Oof. to watch. Yeah, I, I agree. That made me angry. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So, yeah. I, it was a good documentary, though. It was an incredible documentary. Yeah. yeah. Um, any parting thoughts or should we move on to our next review? Uh, I say move on. Okay, cool. All right, well, that's our review of Desert One. Uh, check it out. It's on VOD everywhere, digital, whatever. Um, so check that out. Uh, Desert One, uh, we both liked it, so that's cool. So next up, we're going to kind of close out the episode um, with a review of Unfit, which is hitting VOD. Um, I don't want to say that I'll get this posted on the day, but um, it's hitting VOD on August 28th, um, and I think it's having a theatrical run um as well so i don't know but anyway it's available unfit the psychology of donald trump the american dream is dead i will bring it back who are you consulting with consistently i'm speaking with myself donald trump is like a practical joke that got out of hand 
I think I know more about the environment than most people. He's the most documented liar in human history, I think, at this point. This was the largest audience to ever witness an inauguration, period. You're saying it's a falsehood, and Sean Spicer gave alternative facts. Alternative that facts? The fake news, right? Sociopaths can be successful because they're con men. He cheats all the time. He's going to cheat at golf. You don't think he's going to cheat to win an election? You don't think he's going to cheat? To break rules, to get information from foreign countries? My God, he just admitted he does it. Is Donald Trump fit to serve as the president and commander in chief? I can answer that with one word, no. Um, probably not going to do a spoiler section because yeah. it's kind of hard not hard to right. dance around spoilers. Um, so the plot summary, this is directed by Dan uh, Partland, by the way, uh, document or uh, the synopsis, medical doctors and mental health professionals go on camera on the record for the record for a discussion, analysis and science based examination of the behavior, psyche, condition and stability of President Donald Trump also examines Trump's effect on our citizenry, culture and institutions. Um, so tiny, um, <laughs> unfit, the psychology of Donald Trump in, uh, in, in, in other words, or, or in broad terms, how did you feel about this documentary? I think of the two, this is the less artistic, I guess, is the way to put it. I think, mm-hmm. I think Desert One is much more you know as a fan of documentaries and as a fan of the art you can delve into that one a lot more this this is one of those unfit is one of those documentaries where it's all about the information and the style of the documentary kind of takes a back seat um not to say that it was a bad documentary but mm-hmm. it's it's mostly talking head analysis there's no there's very little archival footage you know mm-hmm. they roll in some clips and stuff like that um and it's effective for sure, but uh, it's not as um, it's not as uh, charming and emotional and stuff like that as, as, right. as Desert One was. But it's still um, an accurate portrayal of the thesis and of the of the idea of the of what they're trying to get across. They do it really well. Mm-hmm. Um, they got great experts, and uh, they got the right people to talk about this, and mm-hmm. uh, they covered the topic really well. Yeah. Um, so I end, I ended up liking it a lot. I don't think it would be like a top 10 or, Interesting. or anything like that. Um, not because, just because it wasn't a particularly artistic documentary mm-hmm. or anything like that. It, it didn't jump out to me that way. That's really interesting. Cause I, I kind of, I agree. It didn't, it didn't have that same artistic flair that Desert One had. Um, there is some kind of, goofy kind of animation in the opening credits and everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, that thought was kind of, kind of nice to set the tone. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's a pretty straightforward kind of documentary. There's, there's not much flair for it, but like you said, they got the right people. Um, the kind of materials, the promotional materials for this boast that it has the like first, um, interview on camera interview about Trump by George Conway, um, who is married to Kellyanne Conway? Yeah, and uh, co-founded the Lincoln Project, um, the group of Republicans that are against Trump or whatever. Mm-hmm. So that's and that that's an interesting hook. I don't think they really do much with him. Right. <laughs> um, he's not in it that much, but there's there's some stuff that I I it kind of uh resonated to. Yeah. The, the kind of struggle that I have with, with unfit, I, I liked the documentary a lot. I, I really, really, really loved it. I, I really think that it is the type of, it's, it's a documentary that people who are people, the people who need to see it or the people who probably should see it and especially see it from the perspective of the people talking in it, um, are the same people who, have their heads in the sand and won't mm-hmm. hear it or anything, right. which is, which is kind of the, the tragedy of our culture right now. Right. But, um, but the thing that uh, a lot of things stood out to me, but something that I thought was interesting is that it, it kind of, it starts out by positing the, the question of, okay, is Donald Trump fit mentally fit to, to be president? And they answer that very quickly. <laughs> mm-hmm. It, it transitions very quickly into a documentary about 
the rise of fascism and uh, um, uh, kind of how democracy can be compromised and how Trump is doing that on a daily basis. Um, and it's something that I thought was very well well uh, demonstrated in in the documentary. Um, it is kind of a from my perspective, it's it's hard to gauge because it is kind of preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. But I think that they presented their case very well, um, and and is terrifying. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think so. Going into it, you know, I knew I knew the premise of the documentary and everything, and. My hang-up was, I was of the opinion that, of course, he's fucking unfit to be the president, right. duh, <laughs> but proving it mm -hmm. scientifically or mm -hmm. proving it um, professionally, right, with the best tools of psychology that we have, I feel like that's a, a different challenge in and to itself. Mm -hmm. And I had heard of the Goldwater Rule before. Yes. And that made a lot of sense to me. And I was of the opinion that no one can really make the call whether or not he is truly clinically unfit, right? Right. Because of the Goldwater rule. And right? that, that to explain it is there was a politician in the 60s mm -hmm. who named, was it Barry Goldwater? Barry Goldwater, yeah. Who, uh, there was, there was like a, a publication that from th uh, over a thousand, I think, psychiatrists, Basically saying that he's unfit for office, that he's that right. he is uh, that he's not mentally capable of it, mm -hmm. um, and so that brought forth a rule in the psychiatric community, I guess, mm -hmm. um, that you can't diagnose a patient without observing them, right. without without examining them, and the documentary, the the um, people that they have in the documentary do a very good job of just explaining why that rule should no longer apply. Right. Um, and I like, it's not in an, an underhanded way. It's just saying that they have access to with social media and the way that Trump is just like ridiculously using like in the spotlight, they can collect enough data and they have collected enough data to prove he is a malignant narcissist. Right. Um, and unfit for office. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I really, I respect them for doing that, for doing that due diligence because that is the reaction to everyone. It's like, well, you can't diagnose a patient if you don't have him as a patient or right. you don't examine him. But it's like, I mean, the world we live in now, let's look at it. Yeah. One of the, one of the best things, uh, <laughs> that I think one of the main psychiatrists said, um, I, I can't remember their names. Um, yeah, me neither. But he, he basically said, you know, the the Goldwater rule is kind of you're not supposed to analyze someone and diagnose them from a distance without interviewing them. And he said, he said, what's funny is a one on one, person to person interview is one of the least revealing ways right. to get to diagnose someone's psychological behavior. And I was mm -hmm. like, holy shit, that's got to be so true because yeah. you know, in that context, they're just going to tell you what you want to hear, exactly. And they might be able to detect deception, mm -hmm. right? The psychologist could detect deception, but doesn't tell you what they're thinking behind that deception, yeah. right? And <laughs> I was like, that's fucking brilliant, you know, because yeah. uh, I was of the opinion, you know, we shouldn't do this, we shouldn't right. diagnose somebody from afar. But I was like. Well, he's going to fucking know a lot better than I am. So right. if he's saying it's a legitimate way to to, to diagnose someone and a, a way to at least gather evidence, mm -hmm. I'm going to take his word for it. And based on what he's telling me, yeah, I think he's got a pretty good idea of what kind of person Donald Trump is. Yeah. And and like you said, you know, it's it's different than 1964 because he has a he has a supercomputer in his pocket mm -hmm. that he tweets his thoughts out on right. all the time. And he's con he's much more visible than, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a lack of a 24-hour news cycle in the 1960s. Right. Um, Trump is constantly being quoted and saying things, and especially with coronavirus, he's on TV every day. Right. And, you know, he stupidly wanted to lead that task force himself. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I, but he put Pence in charge, though. Yeah, Who for has a all while, the... and then it was Fauci for a right, while, right. and then, yeah. Um which is one of the things they point out in the documentary mm. is that that's a very unfit yes. thing to do is that as soon as someone disagrees with you, you get rid of them. Right. Which is, 
you cannot deny it. that's what he's done oh, for the last four years. He's had a rotating a rotating staff essentially in the mm-hmm. West Wing. Um, you know that's that's indicative of his mental instability, and yeah. that was a really good point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the way that the documentary just lays all that out is just really cleanly. It's it's mm-hmm. um in the the people that they got. Um, <laughs> I have literally only read his name. Anthony Scaramucci? Scaramucci the Mooch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh can't really stand him that much. Oh really? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about him. But um they got him and it's just it's interesting to hear these perspectives because these are people that when they show them, they show like, oh, this person has been voting Republican since nineteen eighty. Right. And this has been this person is was involved in the campaign or whatever. Um it's just and it's just showing it it's just saying what should be common sense things to right. anyone that is observing what's going on mm-hmm. um but it's done it's done eloquently and in a way that presents its um its case in a very i would say airtight way but i know that the people who need to see it are just going to ignore it so i don't know yeah yeah um mm. Uh, yeah what else can we really say i know yeah it's 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 incredibly damning i mean it's uh, for me it's it really it's pretty airtight like it's Mm -hmm. i think i think it gives for for people like you and i who Mm -hmm. are uh you know looking at facts and stuff like that right and, and who are not even basically hate donald trump um it gives us a lot of ammunition yeah, but that ammunition is not going to. Uh, it's going to be like, it's it's not a headshot to a zombie, if if right. you will. We're going to be firing these rounds, and they're going to keep coming at us. Yep. It's not it's not going to be effective because nothing will be effective. Right. Um. But what about Biden? I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. Yeah. Um. The the way that it the way that the documentary is structured it does it it sets it sets up the case of uh donald trump's clear mental like disorders Mm -hmm. and everything and then moves into just talking about fascism and uh authoritarianism 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 why am i totalitarianism fascism (laughs) (laughs) and totalitarianism and and um there's another word that i'm I'm completely blanking on. Um, I don't know. Uh, him as a demagogue and everything. And just in it, you, it, that is the more, I mean, it's, it's a very big notion and everything, but the way mm-hmm. that it presents the case and it presents this, it outlines its position on that in terms of Donald Trump versus American democracy is just like you said, it's so damning and it's so, I mean, it's, it paints such a clear picture of what he's doing and something that even I, someone who just adamantly hates the man, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, like I scoffed at was the moment where Scaramucci, I think, uh, says like, people think that he's an idiot, but he's actually really smart. (laughs) And like, I was like, okay, okay. And then they're like, uh, they're like, yeah, well, you know, he's using these tools in like, in like, uh, in, in like dictator speeches and everything, like the rule of threes, like he repeats the same thing three times so mm-hmm. that it becomes fact in people's minds and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I still think he's a fucking idiot, but Jesus, that's like, right. That is, that is, it's just the way that it lays it out is just really, um, horrifying. And, uh, yeah. I, I don't, it's like you said, it's airtight. Like we said, it's airtight. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the, the links to fascism was one of the more interesting things because mm-hmm. it's like, it's, it's such a trigger word to use, right? Yeah. You can't compare anything to Nazis anymore. People just discount you immediately. Right. But I think it was interesting. They kind of focused on Mu- Mussolini first. Yeah. Right. Which was smart. Um, because the two, some of the major tenets of fascism are create a scapegoat, mm-hmm. hoist all negativity onto that scapegoat, and present yourself as the only answer to that problem. Yep. 
which is literally what Trump does multiple times a day. Yes. Via Twitter specifically. Mm-hmm. But it's you you attack leftist liberals and hoist all negativity onto them and then say I have all the answers. I'm the best answer to all this. I can I am the I am the combat to all this negativity. Yeah. Right? And that's that's that is literally the definition of fascism. That's what right. he's doing. And like you said, you know, Joe Biden and Kamal Harris have started developing a message over mm-hmm. the last several weeks. And like you said, part of that message is empathy and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And it's obviously there's plenty of we need to get Trump out of there. And like that's that has to be a part of their campaign. Yeah. But there's more to it than that. That's not mm-hmm. that's not fascistic behavior. Right. Right. It's it's constructive and it's leadership. Right. Mm-hmm. As opposed to scapegoating. Yeah. And, and negativity and conning essentially, it's con man. That's yeah, what he does. Oh yeah, um, and it uh, it's seeing all seeing all that laid out. It's just it's infuriating, and but it's also with the election looming, it's like it's kind of uh, emboldening, I guess. Like it, it's it makes me excited to cast my vote, even though like we talked about in Patreon, we're in Indiana, so mm-hmm. it's a gonna be a red state most likely but who knows but like i said in patreon like just fucking vote guys just vote vote yeah anyway um yeah and i just wanted to highlight this thing so right now as we're recording this like the the republican national convention is going on and like just to piggyback off of tiny's thing just there was a a a clip from the daily show where shows a clip of Don uh, Don Jr. Um, <laughs> his speech it says, "Imagine the life you want to have, one with a great job, a beautiful home, a perfect family. That is the world that Donald Trump and the Republican Party are after. And yes, you can have it." <laughs> um, which is obviously a lot of blowhard stuff, and and uh, what we were talking about. And then Trevor Noah's response is, Trump has been president for almost four years. Why do we still have to imagine how great life could be? (laughs) And it's like, yeah, it's just that's what he does. And the documentary does such a great job of outlining all the, not all the instances, but like like key instances where he uses fabrications and fear mongering and, and and it's, it's what he has done and the vastness of it. Like I had forgotten his attack on the congresswoman uh the quote unquote yeah, the squad right like i had just forgotten about it because so much stuff has happened mm-hmm. and it's just it's oh god it's i don't know so um the documentary is good <laughs> it is good yeah. yeah it's definitely it's totally worth a, worth a watch mm-hmm. um yeah yeah i thought many times like there's people that i know that are going to vote for trump and like i want i wanted to like i thought like i i should just like message someone that i know i don't want to say who but message someone i know and just be like just watch this just watch it yeah. it's an hour and a half watch it right. just watch it from beginning to end <laughs> that's all you have to do but uh i didn't i don't know they'd write it off as fake news yeah yep with no evidence they would no. just say well it's fake news and that's and again that's just it's it's so demoralizing that he has blatantly created a, a, a um a parachute for people to get out of hard questions or anything mm-hmm. like it's just it's so infuriating but another – something that the documentary lays out pretty well that I thought was was uh, an, in, an interesting context is it's ta- – it was talking about um, Scaramucci's uh, – his first time at a Trump rally. And he sees mm. all of these people that are destitute and mm. they are like working class people. And he says that these are people that I – like the kind of people that I lived with and I grew up with. Um, and, in a lower income household and, and community and everything. And it lays out a really good argument or a really good outline of how taking like the, the unsure population, the people that are not sure about their livelihoods or anything, like the working class people like that and twisting it around into, um, 
believing everything that Trump says without question. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Yep. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, great to see someone so thoroughly mm-hmm. uh, laying out all this stuff. But it's also disheartening because it's like it's not. I don't think it's going to have an effect on anything. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just it's it's something else. Right. Um, right. Yeah, like in and uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to go on any more tangents. Right. But the way that the the documentary kind of at the end, uh, toward the end of the documentary, it shifts to talking about coronavirus, and I thought that was just. Those images, like the images of seeing the, like, the, uh, the, um, uh, hospital people, <laughs> mm-hmm. healthcare workers, there we go. Yeah. Healthcare workers and, like, the, like, having to have just the bodies and everything moved to different places and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, those images, like, I've seen them on the news, I've seen them on social media and stuff, but, like, it, Seeing them in the context of this documentary after going through an hour and 10, 15 minutes of setting up all of this and, and talking about just the psychology of Donald Trump in a very clear and understandable way and straightforward. Like they did a really good job of just distilling these, um, these mental disorders into just like understandable dialogue um, seeing that and then seeing this footage of coronavirus and everything just had such a weird impact on me because it just brought home just how just bizarre this world is right now. So yeah. Yeah. And, and how bizarre it is that people still think that we can, we can survive four more years with him. Like it's, that's something that I just can't reconcile in my, in my mind. I know so, it's, it, I can't, I don't know if people can ignore this stuff. Yeah. Yep. So I think that'll do it for this review and the episode. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a review of unfit, the psychology of Donald Trump. I was wrong. It has a virtual and limited like in-person uh, theater run uh, starting August 28th. And then it hits digital on September 1st, um, okay. which I think is when I will hit, release on this episode so that gives Sweet. me a few more days thank god nice. yeah so uh so yeah so yeah that'll do it for this episode um before we go once again you can buy masks at tpublic.com just go to our t public store obsessive viewer um find mask buy them it's really cool um and also if you go on the website we do have some new content um if you go over to tower junkies we're going to be reviewing revival um, it should be up by the time you're listening to this. So that was a fun episode. And I've also reviewed a few movies on the website here. I just want to run through them real quick. Um, I reviewed Tesla. Uh, one star review. Did not like that movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm continuing my Godzilla review series. I just took a break and reviewed King Kong. Um, I also reviewed three movies from Indie Film Fest, which was uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, they have a virtual. They they had a virtual film festival. Uh, it went off very well. Like it, I didn't have any issues or anything, and uh, and and the staff there were really helpful and everything. So I reviewed a movie called The Last Christmas Party, um, a romantic drama set in college. Hum, a sci-fi thriller, and. Uh, Climate of the Hunter, a vampire horror movie. So very eclectic group uh, there. So check that out. Check out my reviews on obsessiveviewer.com. And uh, yeah, I think that'll do it for this episode. Tiny, any parting thoughts for our listeners? Uh, vote for Biden. Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes. Vote for Biden. Um, or yeah. Joe Jorgensen. Yeah, Biden. <laughs> <laughs> and check out Patreon, where we where we talked at length about this stuff. So, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. That'll do it for this episode of um, Obsessive Viewer. No idea what we're coming up with next week, but uh, yeah, it'll be something. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Oh, my God. My throat. Sweet. And now, here's a short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. To hear the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy.
<laughs> um, yeah. Because that is, I think, probably what the current death toll is with COVID. Right. Yeah. Right. A uh, little bit of dark humor for the Patreon. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I'm still not going to vote for Joe Biden, though. Really? He's not going to win Indiana. I still... I... Okay. Well, like, that's the only way my vote would... Like, it only counts in Indiana. If I vote for Joe Biden, it's not going to switch Indiana to Joe Biden. I agree. However, I will say that I am... Yeah, I'm pretty positive that in 2008... Indiana went blue. Right. Um, so there is precedent mm-hmm. and everything. Probably not going to happen. Yeah. But my... So, okay. Okay. My my thinking, and this is something that was confirmed when I watched Desert One and also Unfit, which we'll talk about in the episode. Mm-hmm. But the... Like, I didn't know much of anything about Jimmy Carter or his presidency or anything. Yeah, me either. But the results of that election, the 1980 election, I was just like, that's what needs to happen. Like, <laughs> like that, because, and this is before I even watched Unfit, mm-hmm. because it's like, there is such a, I don't want to say groundswell of support for Trump, but it's like, it's the people who support Trump are not, like, I, I'm going to hopefully write a review of Unfit. Um and like the thing I keep coming back to is like this is the documentary that people who blindly support Trump need to see, but even if they do, they won't listen to it. They no. won't. They won't. It won't. Not even. It's not even that it won't change their minds. It won't. It won't sink into them, even right. with the. I would. It's not. I. In my opinion, it's not even rhetoric. It's just factual right. stuff. Yes. Um. It just doesn't sink in or anything. So my thinking is, like, anyone who, and this is showing my naivete, and probably, like, it's the more um, obnoxious thing to say, (laughs) is that, okay, if you're not going to vote for Biden, you're going to vote for Trump. Like, even if you don't vote, or even if you don't, or even if you vote third party, you're going to vote for Trump. Like you are like, and I feel like they're the um, unwillingness of Trump to entertain or like, to like his income uh, incapacity to show any humility or mm-hmm. to see reality or anything um, is something that I think that everyone should like everyone who is, is like not, you know, a supporter of Trump needs to come together and not vote for Trump and vote for Biden, if only to send a message, to have him fucking humiliated, (laughs) have him win like six states like Jimmy Carter did (laughs) and fucking leave office in just utter disgrace and head into prison, probably. (laughs) Um, I would love that. Yes, yes. I would love that. And like, even if your vote doesn't technically count in fucking Indiana, where we went blue one year or right. one election, I think even if that one vote is counted toward Biden in the popular vote, any any number of those that would otherwise yeah. be a third party vote or not voting would just be a like a tiny little pinprick in in Trump's yeah fucking megalomania right um i might i might yeah. vote for biden just for that nice the obsessive viewer podcast is edited and produced by matt hurt and presented by obsessiveviewer.com for a full archive of our episodes go to obsessiveviewer.com slash ov archive you can also like our facebook page and join the ov facebook group at facebook.com slash the obsessive viewer and follow us on twitter at obsessive viewer and at obsessive tiny and follow our recurring co-hosts at i am mike white that's me at r a feckus and at burger underscore lurker if you enjoy the show please take a couple minutes to leave us a rating and a quick review on apple podcasts this is the easiest way to support what we do and all it costs is a little bit of your time if you'd like to donate to the podcast you can make a paypal donation at obsessiveviewer.com slash donate 
or support us on Patreon for recurring donations and access to commentary tracks and B-roll audio recorded exclusively for patrons at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Every donation goes toward paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. For official Obsessive Viewer merch, including shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more, visit our Tee Public store. You can find a link to the store in the show notes of this episode and at obsessiveviewer.com slash donate. Or you can simply search for Obsessive Viewer at teepublic.com, T-E-E, public.com. For information about our annual live event showcasing short horror films from local filmmakers, check out shocktoberinirvington.com. And for an archive of all our events, as well as news about potential future events, head over to obsessiveviewer.com slash live. For more podcast content, you can find Anthology, Matt's solo podcast covering The Twilight Zone, and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology TV shows at anthologypod.com and on Twitter at OVAnthologyPod. You can also find Tower Junkies, a podcast where Matt and Tiny share their love of all things Stephen King and his magnum opus, The Dark Tower series, at TowerJunkiesPod.com and at TowerJunkiesPod on Twitter. And finally, check out The Secular Perspective, Tiny's side project podcast, which tackles current events and life's big questions from the perspective of secular hosts Chad and Amanda at TheSecularPerspective.com. The theme music for The Obsessive Viewer comes courtesy of the band Loudlike from their EP, Mistakes We Must Make. Additional bumper music is provided courtesy of As Good As It Gets, which can be found at facebook.com slash asgoodasitgetsband. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Kitty!